our failure 
and sharing our faith. Fill us with your spirit. Christe eleisons.
Our psalm today is appointed as Psalm 23. Please join me in reading it responsibly by half the verse. The Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And leads me beside still waters. He revives my soul. And guides me along right pathways for his name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. For you are with me, your God and your Sabbath, they comfort me. You spread a table before me in the presence of those who trouble me. You give my anointing to my head with oil, and my heart is running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. <clears throat> the second reading is a reading from the letter of the Ephesians. Once you were in darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of the light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what such people do secretly. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Sleeper, awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on thee. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> He said to them, 
He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your, your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the blind man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said to him, <clears throat> Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God, we know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, I now see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciple? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to the one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and you are trying to teach us. And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him. And the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sinned. But now that you say, we see, your sin remains. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Those are words of comfort, balm for weary souls. And there's power in those words. When I was working as a chaplain, I found it interesting and truth be told, rather convenient, that so many of my patients who did not consider themselves to be religious or a follower of any particular faith tradition would report to me that these words were what came to, my, came to them in times of trouble, uncertainty, or great need. Then again, perhaps it's not all that surprising because these words, that these words would be so familiar to, their, to my patients and their families. 
After all, phrases of Psalm 23 are seemingly everywhere. On greeting cards, on keychains, on bumper stickers. And for any of you BBC television fans, at the beginning and end of every episode of The Vicar of Dibley. <laughs> I will admit that most often, when I hear the words of Psalm 23, what I see in my mind's eye is that slow flyover of rolling green hills, their patchwork pattern outlined by small stone walls and hedgerows, sheep peacefully grazing or joyfully romping about, and Howard Goodall's lyrical setting of these words played during the show's opening and closing credits. A pastoral scene, indeed. I wonder, does this scene or a very similar scene come to mind for you and provide you comfort? Or do these words, this scenery, sometimes miss the mark? Rather than providing comfort, do the words of Psalm 23 feel a bit hollow or even cliché? Because really, the heroes of life require something with a bit more teeth to it. Those verdant green pastures and romping lambs are true. And David's psalm has more teeth to it than many of us today might think. Because to be a good shepherd is to be both livestock farmer and land conservationist. The needs of the flock for nutrition, physical activity, and safety must be balanced with, the land, with what the land can provide, as well as what it can withstand. The perfect pasture can become a wasteland if overgrazed, setting into motion an ecological chain reaction diminishing the grazing options for other flocks that year and for all in seasons to come. Sheep who are not kept reasonably on the move may become bored and mischievous, breaking through or finding ways around fencing, or they may, may become overweight and cast down. That would be shepherd speak for flipped over on their back with their legs in the air, unable to get back on their feet unaided and at risk of dying. But moving sheep is not as simple as opening the sheep gate from one pasture to another and allowing the sheep to move through. The shepherd must go ahead of the flock before they are moved. Because sheep, especially new lambs, will eat just about anything put in front of them. So if poisonous weeds are found to be sprouting in the next pasture, the shepherd must change their grazing plans or take decisive steps to see to the weeds eradication. Having their flock inadvertently poisoning themselves is just one of the hazards a good shepherd works to avoid. There's also the dangers of rampaging rivers and floods and avalanches and rock slides and predators waiting to ravage the flock, not to mention storms of snow and sleet and hail and ice. And then, of course, there are the twice yearly long trips from the low-lying winter pastures to the higher altitude summer grazing lands and back down again. And as you may know, getting up a mountain almost always involves traveling through a valley. Valleys bring with them all the dangers of open grazing land, but intensify. The days are shortened, and the nights are longer. A good shepherd has traveled these valleys before and knows the roots that though the land the flock is in is treacherous, there is crisp, clean water flowing and sufficient food to sustain them until they break through to higher ground. And just like humans, sheep have personalities, or at least proclivities. There are those who follow their shepherd willingly. And then there are others who, seemingly, who are seemingly keen to determine their own path. Those who charge ahead whom the shepherd has to pull back to the safety of the flock. And those who are easily distracted and found wandering in, a little, in need of a little extra nudging so as to not be left behind. A good shepherd has been known to risk life and limb 
to rescue just one wayward sheep for the trouble they have brought on themselves through their self-determined ways. The composer George Frederick Handel, setting the text of the prophet Isaiah in his masterwork, Messiah, hits the nail on the head. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one turned to their own way. It's true. Like sheep, most of us don't want to come when we're called. We don't want to follow. We don't want to be led on right paths. Somehow it goes against the very grain of our being. We would actually prefer to turn to our own way, even though it, makes us, it may take us straight into trouble. To be a good shepherd to a human flock is to know intimately the needs of each individual, as well as what the body can withstand as a whole. It means Christ is everything in God's power to prepare a way for us, so that in following the path, which will inevitably lead through dark valleys fraught with dangers, we will be fed and our spirits refreshed. So to ensure that we once again make it out into the light and the greater safety of verdant pastures dotted with groves of trees. Christ makes no promise of an easy life. Christ does promise God's unwavering presence, felt all the more readily when we devote time to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. Promises made at our baptism. Christ is our shepherd. Christ, who enters through the sheep gate and calls us each by name, longs to spend time with us, to know our inmost thoughts and fears and hopes. It's by spending time with Christ, just as a shepherd and their sheep, that we come to know and trust God's presence with us in the high summer pasture and in the low winter field or the dark valley. The question at hand is not whether we will have or have had many or few valleys. It's not whether those valleys are filled with such darkness as to have swallowed every light or merely dimly lit with shadows. The question is how do we respond to them? How do we go through them? How do we cope with the calamities and disappointments and uncertainties that come our way? We know with a surety that the only way up is through. It is with Christ that we are able to face what awaits in the cover of the valley calmly. It is with God's guiding spirit that we are able to face them with courage. Like the man born blind in our own challenges and travails, we are blessed. In turn, may we become a benediction to those around us, those who live in fear and the shadow of the valley. Amen.
Please stand as you are able and join in affirming our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, the eternally begotten of the Father, the God from God, light from light, true God from true God. God did not make, but one being with the Father, through whom really all things were made. For us and for our salvation, He came down from heaven. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, He became incarnate in the Virgin Mary and was made fully human. For our sake, He was crucified in the Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, He rose again. at Boston University in Brookline, the Church Home Society, and for the unity of all peoples, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For our bishops, Alan and Carol, and for all the clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For our president, Joseph, for the leaders of the nation, and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Foxborough, for every city and community, and for those who live in them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For seasonable weather and for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the good earth which God has given us, and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the aged and infirmed, for the widowed and orphaned, and for the sick and suffering, especially Phyllis and the Philip family, for Betty and the Charbonneau family, for Bob and Bob and Deb, Debbie, Hugh, Carolyn, Katie Farrell, and Kimberly, and all of those who are in need of our prayers. Are there others? For all of these people and all that we hold in our heart, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For deliverance from danger, violence, oppression, and degradation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the absolution and remission of our sins and offenses, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. That we may end our lives in faith and hope, without suffering and without reproach, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. 
In the communion of St. Mark and all of the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and our life to Christ our Lord. To you, O Lord, our God. Almighty God, to whom our needs are known before we ask, help us to ask only what accords with your will, and those good things which we dare not, or in our blindness cannot ask, grant for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. My siblings in Christ, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Amen. I invite you to greet one another in a sign of Christ's peace. We have a lot of announcements that are all well printed in our bulletin, um, but of course we have others that we want to highlight. I have been asked to speak of the Lenten suppers. When you are coming, could you please make an effort to sign up what you're bringing so that it's known what food is coming and what is not coming so that we may prepare a balanced meal. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm Tina Shinnick, for those of you who don't know me. And I just want to say for those of you who were not able to attend the St. Patrick's dinner last night, you missed one good party. <laughs> we had a lot of fun. And we played a lot of games had a lot of laughter and we handed out prizes. The raffle is continuing today, so if you're coming downstairs for coffee and conversation and for our parish meeting, it's not too late to buy some raffle tickets and put them into wherever you want to have the best chance to win. I also want to give a big thank you to everybody who worked so hard to pull off the dinner last night. at 3.30 yesterday afternoon to set up the, the um, what do you call it downstairs, the undercroft. And in particular, when Jen Quinn showed up, I said, Jen, you're the food captain. And she said, oh, okay. And she worked really hard the entire time. So she deserves a huge <laughs> Thank you, Tina. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
together and really definitely um, took us to the finish line. And what's also wonderful is that even if you didn't come last night, you still have an opportunity to participate because we have a raffle we haven't pulled yet. So you can get your raffle prizes. We have five wonderful prizes. And we'll be pulling it right before we start our meeting. So I'll be outside after the church. Hi. 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 Okay. Uh, I personally invite you to come um, today at 2 o'clock. There's um, it's my concert, I guess, right? <laughs> it's, uh, we're performing for the Lacey Stabat Mater, which if you've not heard of that, um, it's a poem from mm, a long time ago. <laughs> it's in Latin, that's how we know. That is, um, <laughs> it's about um, Mary sitting at the foot of Jesus' cross. So it's a little bit of a different perspective on Lent. But don't worry, it's in Latin, and I hate, I mean, I don't want to say this, but it's really fun to sing that. <laughs> Which is weird, but it's a very passionate um, piece by Pergolesi that was two singers and a pianist. And um, it's only about 35, 40 minutes long. So if you want to come back at 2 o'clock, don't be late, because then I will be <laughs> if you need to um, be reminded what to bring to uh, fill our food pantry, we're looking for canned vegetables. So each time you eat your vegetable this week, I want you to think about the canned vegetables you're going to bring to church, and remember to bring the canned vegetables to church to fill our pantry. Thank you. Are there any other announcements? Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. sacraments, 
they may come to the fullness of grace which you have prepared for those who love you. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name.
the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died and lives for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. This is God's table where all who hunger will be fed.
we're kneeling as we're able. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of our Son, our Savior Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood, set us now to the world of peace, and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Let us remember that Lent should be more than a time of fasting. Lent should also be a joyous season of feasting. Lent is a time to fast from certain things and to feast on others. It is a season to return to God. This Lent, may we fast from self-concern and feast on compassion for others. May we fast from personal anxiety and feast on eternal truth. May we fast from discouragement and feast on hope. May we fast from facts that, de that depress and feast on truths that uplift. May we fast from lethargy and feast on enthusiasm. And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and those you love this day and always. Let us bless the Lord. 